at that point in our growth trajectory, it really was just about make more money than you spend. A lot of incredibly smart people mm. mentored me and I was an engineer. How do you focus on your people? How do you grow your people? How do you keep yourself healthy? Hey, welcome to Dev Better. Today, we get to flip the script, and Alyssa interviews me. Alyssa, hi, how are you? Hi, I'm doing great. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So Good happy to, to be here. So, yeah. Yes, I was called in today to flip the script. So instead of Jeremy asking all the questions, I'm going to take it from him today. And we're going to dive into what it means to be a CEO, the ins and outs, and how Jeremy got here today. Sure. So let's just go ahead and kick it off, mm -hmm. starting with the story. So I'm assuming you weren't always a CEO. <laughs> I heard you were once a software engineer. So kind of tell us that story. Did you ever yeah. think you would be here? How did this no, all happen? Not at all. Um, yeah. My, so I started my career working for a company called Danger, and we built the T-Mobile sidekick. So I got out of college at Georgia Tech uh, doing my bachelor's degree in computer science, which is another fun story. <laughs> um, but graduated, went to work for Danger, uh, got to know a lot of the team there, and those folks were luminaries like some of them went to work at netflix sort of the initial um, machinations of that company others went to go work at our roku and start that company so um, after we kind of dissolved which i'll get to in a second a lot of incredibly smart people mm. mentored me and i was an engineer i was uh i worked on localization which we called l10n if anybody knows what that is um, and I, I was primarily focused on, on building out features uh, related to Telstra and Rogers and other sort of, uh, in the States, we don't know who those people are, but they're um, mobile carriers that are in other countries like Canada and Australia and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. worked on a lot of that and worked on some other things on the T-Mobile on, on the Sidekick, which was the product that Danger um, brought to bear. And it was a really cool product. I really enjoyed it. So I was a software engineer at the low level on into the back end, which was written in Perl, believe it or not. <laughs> we, they scaled a serious back end in a language that everybody thought was a meme. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And then Java, we were one of the first um, JVMs to run on top of an ARM9 processor. So a lot of really cool things were happening um, at Danger when I was there. I learned from some of the best firmware engineers I had ever met and some of the best just software engineers. Still to this day, I have friendships. Uh, folks like Joe George, shout out, Sean Curran. Um, Sid Halloway, like people like that that I worked with and actually had um, breakfast this morning with Michael Morrissey, who is the CTO of Full Story, or he, he was the CIO, excuse me, of Full Story, and he worked at Danger too. So I had a really cool sort of beginnings to my, my uh, career where I was writing code and implementing software and breaking the build and getting called at midnight because I was an idiot and broke the build. Um, <laughs> learned Perforce, which is something nobody knows about these days, uh, but it's still alive and well. And other things. And so Microsoft came and bought us. This is Steve Ballmer's Microsoft. So mm -hmm. not the one you unfortunately <laughs> want to work for. Sorry. Uh, Satya Nadella has done a much better job with that company. No offense, Steve. Um, but uh, back then, Microsoft would purchase the company and absorb the IP and then lay everybody off. They did this with Web TV and a few other companies. It's kind of a normal thing back then. Mm -hmm. um, and so went to work for Microsoft for two years, learned how that company worked. Um, I actually liked it, despite the fact that it ended sort of serendipitously. Um, and spent time, you know, diving into C Sharp. Uh, my background, like I've always been drawn to multiple programming languages. Uh, some of my master's work was in programming language design and static analysis, along with I did work in the GVU lab with Keith Edwards over at the, the Pixie lab um, and Melody Jackson Moore and Al Alex Orso. So all these really, really smart people at Georgia mm -hmm. Tech were folks that I just sort of gravitated to and clung to and asked mm -hmm. questions and said, help me understand how to be a good engineer. And some of the academics that you learn in school obviously don't apply when you hit the industry. Yeah, that real world experience. Uh, exactly. Yeah. But I enjoyed the academics because it challenged me and it helped me sort of form a rigorous set of ideas around how programming languages are built. You know, what's the point of, of, of creating this higher level abstraction over assembly and, you know, how do JVMs work? How do virtual machines work? Yada, yada, yada. Again, really super deep, boring stuff. But to me, it was super exciting. Microsoft was great. Uh, they laid everybody off. Uh, 
I, I think around, I don't remember exactly the year, but uh, we worked on this thing called the Kin. Uh, nobody's ever heard of it. Google it if you want a funny story. It, it was a complete and utter piece of garbage. I don't know what, everybody when we got the first dev boards were like, what is this thing? There's no way this is going to sell at all. Um, so we were all ready. We knew it was coming. Um, and that's when I got into consulting. I worked for um, some consulting firms, very large consulting firms. I was one of the first folks in, in an Atlanta market. And um, the folks there really helped me learn how to be a good consultant. And that was really where things sort of switched for me, right? Mm -hmm. I was a product engineer for the first five, six years, probably five years of my career where we were building things um, on the market. And then I swapped into now I'm a hired gun. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I am here to just work for other people. Uh, my biggest client was a certain retailer whose logo was orange and sells hammers. Uh, and I've loved every minute of my time with those folks because they were going through a huge transition. This was mm -hmm. like the late 2010s um, on into, you know, the early sort of the mid half of that 2010 to 2015 era where agile transformations were all the rage. Mm -hmm. Like Deloitte was selling these massive ones. My company, which was slalom was selling these massive ones. Everybody was looking at digital transformations. And this was sort of the scrum Renaissance where folks were like, uh, let's do agile and let's do scrum. And, and again, very good things for industry it had some unintended consequences, which I rant about in other videos, like comment, subscribe. Um, but it was a good time to be an engineer because people cared about us. Mm -hmm. And they cared about what we were doing and they, they gone were the, the late nineties sort of value engineering play of let's just, you know, offshore 90% mm -hmm. of our operations and onshore 10% because writing code is like the way we used to do things in Fortran and COBOL. It's people in a dark room that are just doing things that nobody cares about. Yeah. And they produce a deliverable that we then use and complain about because it doesn't work right. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I wonder why it doesn't work right. You're not talking to your software engineers. Anyway, rant aside, Spent my time there and really loved consulting. Like the relationship piece to me was was the thing that I was missing the most. Um, consulting firms notoriously are not great at providing a spot for developers to enjoy what they do, mm -hmm. right? And so I decided uh, through talking to mentors and spending a lot of time thinking to myself to step out on my own as an independent consultant um, to create for myself the life I wanted, which was work with cool clients, do work I liked, mm -hmm. be a nerd, like dig into the cool stuff. Don't just be stuck at that sort of consulting dashboards for CEOs and CIOs type level, yeah. which again, there's value there. I'm not saying it's bad, but to me, that was boring. I wanted something fun and interesting that harkened back to my product days and built Seven factor over time. So to your question, roundabout way of answering, I never, when I stepped out on my own, thought, you know what, I'm going to be the CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm. Mm -hmm. I, that's my goal in life. I'm not really a planner anyway. You know, <laughs> you work for me. I'm not a planner. I'm a wing it kind of dude. Day by day, yes. I just wing things, right? Jazz musician. I just wing it because to me, <laughs> improvisation is sort of a, a space where creativity can come out and you can do things that are fun and it's a challenge, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm just a little bit well, lazy. It's probably your software mindset of, you know, it's always a puzzle and you're always solving a problem. 100%. So you're not... You're comfortable in problems. Right. And I like to solve. And I like being lazy, to be frank. Uh, it's just, it, it actually, you know what? Laziness is an attribute of a good software engineer, and that's another show. Um, but I think uh, that. I learned through lots of conversations with lots of people that consulting was something that I could do and mm -hmm. something I enjoyed doing. So I stepped out on my own, took a bonus check, threw it into a business bank account, got a cool logo because why not? I wasn't really planning on building a company. I'm like, this is pretty sexy. I can make, you know, cool logos and make some, you know, those little lights that we have make kind of a cool little. It was a nice logo. Uh, I didn't have to design it. Yeah. It was a good one to work with. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I, I was happy with that and just stepped out and and turns out people knew me for a lot of the things that I had done at previous companies mm -hmm. and when they heard I was on the market they're like oh dude you were great can you come work with me and I'm mm -hmm. like sure so initially you kind of take on a lot of work and this is just building a services firm is another episode we're going to do soon but there's a lot of things you have to do early on where you're kind of the star of the show and yeah. you're doing everything like there's three iterations of seven factor there's like 1.0 2.0 and 3.0 again yeah. nerd um so 1.0 a lot of that was me learning how to delegate and how to fashion 
uh, a team that could deliver against the requirements on a shoestring budget, which, by the way, is very, very difficult to yeah. do. I was doing a lot of the early work, so I wasn't really a CEO. I kind of see my role here as sort of transcending over those three versions. In version one of Seven Factor, I was a software engineer. I was a lead software engineer. I was a director of application development. I was a business development executive. And I was a client manager. I wasn't a marketer because I sucked at it and you didn't exist yet. <laughs> we Our website was garbage. Yes, it was. I, I wasn't, <laughs> I, I wasn't um, like a BD. I wasn't uh, like a partner manager or, or a client services person. Like I didn't do any of the things that our existing team did. I just walked in the door and delivered value. And my clients enjoyed it and they liked me and they liked what they were getting and they liked their rates because back then, you know, you take the work you get yeah. um, and produced value. And that sort of built the seed where in 2.0, we got to about that 25, 30 person mark, right? Mm -hmm. At this many people, you can't really do it by yourself anymore. Yeah. So I started being more of a VP of application development. I still was not a CEO, I don't think at this point. Like I understand running a business on, you know, charge more money or uh, make more money than you spend, right? Mm -hmm. And then this is a very reductionist view of kind of the financials of a business. So no, <laughs> CFOs, please don't throw rocks at me. I'm not t telling you that your job is easy. It's a difficult job. But at that point in our growth um, trajectory, it really was just about make more money than you spend mm -hmm. and focus on reinvesting that. Like a lot of early, like if I were a lifestyle business, I would have taken all those excess profits and just thrown them in my account on, a ta on an owner draw, which is tax free mm -hmm. and been good to go and bought a Tesla or whatever I wanted. Um, but instead, I, at that point in 2.0 land, I was like, hey, you know what? We have something interesting here. Yeah. We have a mechanism of delivery that I think is, is different enough from what others do and our brand being a software engineer owned and operated consulting firm, it's just different enough that I think we could turn this into something interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started being more strategic and ascending into more of a CEO role was that 2.0. And now at 3.0, I'm fully in the seat of a boring CEO, uh, which <laughs> there are things I love about this job. There are things that are boring. We'll talk about that. But um, I, it took it took literally six years for me to become a CEO, yeah. right? You're never as an entrepreneur and as an on the ground person, you are not a CEO. Despite the fact that your title is that, you're you're kidding yourself if you think that you're a CEO or if you think that's the only thing you should be doing to make your business survive, you probably aren't cut out to be a business owner. <laughs> Yeah, one thing at a time. For sure. sure. So as you kind of talked about these different mm -hmm. versions of Seven Factor yeah. and you growing alongside this business in your title, mm -hmm. as you're kind of looking over it as a storyboard, how has the CEO priorities mm -hmm. in your tasks kind of shifted throughout this journey? Yeah, for sure. Um, in 1.0, the priority was fine business, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and Small business 101. And don't Get suck. clients, yes. And, and don't, don't get suck. fired. Yes. Don't get fired. <laughs> that was priority one. And priority, uh, in, in Seven Factor 2.0, the priority became came keep talent mm -hmm. I would I would say was the theme because we were a mid-sized we we're kind of like a awkward senior in high school right we were mid-sized we kind of knew what we wanted to be when we grew up but we weren't quite sure mm -hmm. um, we had excellent talent um, we did do a few reorganizations and and sort of sorted out who the best long-term fit are because this is another mistake don't make as an entrepreneur the people that join you early might not be the people that serve you late. Yeah. Um, because it just depends on their thought. Not everybody wants to work for a mid-sized company that has processes and specific ideologies. They love and thrive in that sort of cowboy atmosphere. And there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. And those people are very valuable early on, but they may eventually decide that, eh, you guys are a little bit too much red tape for me. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that we've never been known for red tape. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and I think, and 3.0, my priorities now is enabling leaders and and focusing on them getting what they need to run the business. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of really amazing leaders like yourself and Sarah and Alan in positions that they've never been in before, mm -hmm. uh, just like me. And I like that. I think that's a, that's an awesome uh, growing uh, and proving ground mm -hmm. for everyone to to get their heads wrapped around what makes Seven Factor an interesting company to work for and with. And I think that brings a lot of fresh perspectives that we've frankly benefited from quite, quite highly. Yeah. And I think we can kind of dive into that culture maybe a little bit more because as someone who's also grown at this company, mm. the culture is very much that you're smart enough to be here. Yeah. Let's see what you can do. 100%. So from your CEO leader <laughs> perspective, how do you kind mm -hmm. of inspire those people and how do you get these leaders in these positions and yeah. make them confident and growing? So I made a few mistakes there. <laughs> um, I think um, I didn't... 
<laughs> didn't put Alan in the seat early enough. Sorry, Alan. Uh, I love you, man. Um, because this was my thing. Like I created this. This sounds incredibly narcissistic, so forgive me, but this was my thing. I created this business. I, yeah. I spent my nights and weekends um, building the the street cred and the political capital with my clients to be able to continue this business on. Mm -hmm. A lot of consulting firms are sort of one hit wonders in that, you know, they get one big client and they ride that horse until that VP that they're good friends with leaves and all of a sudden they lose all their business and they shut their doors. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of money for the founder, uh, perhaps pays the people too, depending on how human focused the founder is, but it doesn't create a brand that lasts mm -hmm. and that endures. So, I think the way that you enable the company is by enabling these leaders and putting them in, in positions as quickly and as early as you can, but also providing them with a support network, which I would argue I have not done an amazing job of, right? Yeah. It wasn't really until this year that we started um, double downing and, and investing in, um, in the leaders that we have where they are and, and giving them the leeway to make mistakes mm -hmm. and to grow, but also equipping them with the right people in their network and the right um, materials mm -hmm. to, to, to excel, right? Yeah. And I think that um, if I had it all to do again, I would probably focus on putting those, installing those people sooner. But honestly, my my personality is if I'm going to do it, it's going to be right. Yeah. So I think I probably still would have done exactly what I did. <laughs> Even if I gave myself that advice, I'd be like, no, I'm just going to do this myself. That until... couldn't have been me telling myself no, that. No, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's, 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 it's tough because it's your baby. And I swore to myself I wouldn't be like this, but it, you never know what you're going to do until you're actually in the situation. Yeah, I think... And control is a bad word for it. But it, I mean, it is it at is the end what of the it day. Is. Yeah. And I've seen... I mean, obviously, as someone who's been here... Over four years now, I've seen scaling is just difficult. That was mm. our motto for like two years. It was. Scaling is hard. And watching you, yes, mm -hmm. our clients were <laughs> referrals of yours, partners of yours, knew you by name to watching right. other people bring in leads, like mm -hmm. a cold lead from a website, a new yeah. partner, a, oh, that's cool. And you being proud of us, but mm -hmm. like feeling some kind of, <laughs> oh my gosh, am I providing worth? Because I wasn't even a part of any of that. And right. I think that's a really hard aspect of this industry and growing a business is trusting your people trust but verify like we yeah, say for sure knowing that you've planted all the seeds to really watch it grow and you hit on something there uh that i think we could we could talk about for a very long time and that is feeling useless at the top um and i i remember talking to some mentors uh when i was at slalom um and, and I had this same sort of idea where I was a team lead, right? And I was used to being on the ground and doing things, right? Mm -hmm. And executing. And when you become a team lead slash whatever it was back then, I don't remember the name of it, um, you start having to delegate more. And that feels awkward. And I never I remember what, what some of my folks said to me. They're like, look, your success is not based on what you can provide. Your success is based on what your team can provide. Mm -hmm. When you think of it that way, you're pretty damn successful, if you have a working company that are doing the right things. And that helped me switch my brain a little bit because I think a lot of people who transcend into more of a true traditional CEO type role, they tend to just focus on the numbers yeah. and they start to obsess over the levers and dials they can pull to make their company successful. I can't argue with that at a billion dollar level where you have um, you know, IPO stockholders and all this. Like Those are the types of things that your shareholders are going to ask you to do I can't really argue with that sort of mindset, but in my industry where it's a consulting firm, mm -hmm. we're less worried about those types of things because the margins are the margins. And as long as you make your margins, you're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And the talent is the most important thing. So you have to make sure that you're not obsessing over the wrong things mm -hmm. um, in those seats. This video is sponsored by us. To continue our mission of providing valuable educational resources to current and future software engineers and tech professionals, we've officially launched the Dev Better newsletter. Our monthly newsletter will bring highlights of the tech industry right to your inbox at the end of every month. Within each Dev Better newsletter, you'll find the top tech news stories, job postings that we believe are worth your time, and more importantly, development tips for your ever-growing knowledge base. If you think this is something you'd read, We've left a link in the description for you to subscribe for free. Now let's get back to the video. So you just kind of hinted at there's things you <laughs> shouldn't focus on. Right. So where you are right now, fully in the CEO seat, yep. has a 50 plus person company. <laughs> what 
are you focusing on? What should CEOs yeah. be focusing on? Still figuring that out to some degree, <laughs> right? Um, I think the focus really for me is on the health of the business, obviously. Like again, going down to the tacticals, are, are we bringing value to clients? Um, are we doing the things that differentiate us in the market? Because our market is saturated by a lot of things, right? You have offshore, you have staffing agencies, you have other companies like us that believe you know, in quality delivery. And there's plenty of room for all of us to operate, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, but figuring out how you approach the market in a novel way is something that I've started thinking about. A lot of people think about this at the beginning. I, and, and, you know, perhaps- I think did, I to kind some of did. aspect. I think I did it naturally. Like to yeah. my, to my disc discredit, I didn't sit down and obsess over, well, what's my go-to-market strategy? I didn't care. My go-to-market strategy was show up and do things, right? Because clients want you to add value, yeah. right? But I think intrinsically, I knew that quality- was the focus. Yeah. You knew how you were going to show up and mm -hmm. do those. And you clearly outlined them in our seven factors, yeah, exactly. which <laughs> is one of the things I love to market is that they haven't changed at all. And they're sure. all still just Very as relevant. consistent and relevant in our right. day to day. So you got something right. For sure. And the idea behind those seven factors was that these are concepts that drive the, ce the central execution of teams because mm -hmm. we've always been a team based company. And sort of my mission is to try and get this industry to figure out, and we have to a degree, right? I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but not really, uh, in that we have to we have to involve the execution arm of our plans in our plans in order to produce good plans. Kind of using plans a lot there, but uh, <laughs> to unpack that and make it less confusing, um, for a long time, developers have been at the table, mm -hmm. right? Scrum has produced a decent environment for us to be a part of those conversations and to produce value in our enterprise, you know, through product giving us things to do. And then we were like, no, oh, that's a crazy idea. Why would you do that? Yada, yada, yada. Right. What Scrum has done a bad job of producing is a framework to say no. Mm -hmm. A framework to say that sprint commit is insane. Because most developers, uh, again, unless you're, you're trained to say no, mm -hmm. are simply going to take what you say and go do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially in a big enterprise, because enterprises, y'all are supposed to be like the cream of the crop. You're supposed to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You've been around for a long time. You have billions of dollars behind you. You should know what you're doing. But any good product and engineering partnership will sit around and say, we don't quite have it perfect. Mm -hmm. There's always things we can do to make it better. And so coming to the table with your software engineering team and your product team and having those conversations, that's where my heart has always been. I've always spent my time obsessing over making sure that product and development are talking the same language mm -hmm. and that they're able to produce on the other side on out to your DevOps and your deployment pipeline, the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember back in the day, my slogan was building the right thing, which turned into, we build good, good things. things yeah. <laughs> and I've, I, people have actually thrown rocks at me and said, why, why not? Great. I'm like, because good is good, right? Good is a word that doesn't just mean like, mediocre yeah. like don't take good to mean mediocre it means good it means good enough it means which is a thing like in our industry you want to build something that's good enough software is about trade-offs there are mm -hmm. economics to these trade-offs how much time you spend on building something um how much uh, energy you devote to building the right thing are we doing test driven are we writing tests are we are we following that up with with smoke tests like deployment there's so many things you can dig into there but the idea is that our focus as engineers should be on building the right thing and getting it out on time mm -hmm. and so that was the center and that's where the seven factors come from that's kind of where i lived um, for a very long time. And that trans transcended into what we do now, right? Mm -hmm. But at a higher level, now I'm kind of asking teams to go off and do things, which is a different set of challenges <laughs> than simply sitting down and calling an audible, right? And just, you know, throwing the football and making the touchdown because I'm the quarterback and I can just point and people go. Mm -hmm. Now you got the headset on, on the sidelines. Right, which is team. harder, yeah. I would argue, right? <laughs> not everyone's cut out for it, yeah. <laughs> it's not an easy job. People that think that, oh, I could be a CEO, you have no clue what what stress lies like be, you could be a bad ceo <laughs> and just chill out and 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 look at your numbers and read your paper and tell people to do things and then they don't they don't do it because they don't care and they don't respect you like it's it's an exercise in change management and handling people which i love people and that's mm -hmm. that's the reason i'm still here like yeah. if i sucked at this and i was bad what well, 
arguably I probably do, but I'm better than most. I would certainly have already found someone else to sit in this seat. Yeah. Um, because I value my humans um, more than my own personal pride. So you kind of just touched on, mm. you can be a bad CEO and maybe it's not cut out for everyone. So sure. what kind of tokens and tidbits of advice would you give to someone that's maybe seeing themselves forecasting in that way or maybe aspires to be yeah. in this role? I think um, don't be afraid of it is my first point of advice. Uh, imposter sin is it not syndrome. I don't know what it is now. They call it something else these days, but imposter syndrome is what I'm going to call it is a real thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think staying humble is important, but also staying confident. Um, there's a difference between confidence and arrogance. It's about how you treat people. If you're confident, then you can sit across the table from someone and say, this is what I think, and but not talk down to them or make them feel like, you know, they, they don't know what they're talking about and generally just rip the human element away from that conversation, right? It's, yeah. it's really is about forging the right relationships, but also making sure that everybody understands that you're a good captain and mm -hmm. that you're ready to go, right? And I, this is something I've had challenges with over the years um, because I, I do have, you know, some, some issues with, with that. And from a self-confidence perspective is, am I the right person to do this work? And it's, it's a struggle to really figure out, yeah, I am because I, I have done this. I have built this company. I've spent a lot of my own personal time and energy creating something that other people like, yeah. right? And that's a huge win for me. It's a huge win for them. So the advice really would be just be to stay humble and to focus on, on, what what are you trying to do with the people on your team? You may have a giant product idea and it may be amazing and you may yeah. be able to make a lot of money off of it. But I mean, even if you look at like Elon Musk and the people we look to, the only reason they are where they are is the people that worked in those companies to produce the value that these individuals then went on to be able to take advantage of. Yeah. So it's the second you lose sight that it's about the folks that work with you, is the second that you're going to create a revolving door culture and it's not it's not going to work out for you very well. <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to stay in that pool of sure. everyone and not kind of disconnect and close that door. I right. think that you're separate than just doing that command line, which is yeah. again about communication and, and feedback and honesty. Transitioning from an engineer to a CEO, I would argue, is one of the most hardest things I've ever done um, because I, I'm used to talking to computers and now I talk to people all yeah. day. And you people, didn't. <laughs> people are arguably more irritating than computers. <laughs> We watched that sad transition. I watched Jeremy realize that he wasn't an engineer anymore. And yeah. it, it was sad. It was sad. <laughs> but we're happy that you're here. So you, you've made it. Mm -hmm. Some would say it's the top of the mountain. Yeah. Yes. I mean, what's what's above CEO? Like right. the CEO of CEO. So. Uh, so Yourself, right? Um, you are above yourself. And, and so they, they have. there's a saying, you probably heard it, you know, being at the top is, is lonely or it's lonely at the top. It, it's mm -hmm. true, to be honest. Yeah. Like. There's not really many people that I can sit down and really say what I'm feeling sometimes to because I, one, uh, I, that's not appropriate. And yeah. two, um, those people can't help me. <laughs> they can't tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times I've just defaulted to, and I, I'm a confirmation type person. Like I, I am always very collaborative. You know me, we've been in meetings before where I'm always seeking confirmation from other people. And I'm like, what yeah. do you think? Do you think this is a good idea? And a lot of the times that helps me make sure that I am thinking right. Mm -hmm. When you're at this level, there's nobody you can seek confirmation to. And in this particular industry, I would argue it's a little toxic because services is very competitive. Mm -hmm. So there's nobody that you can go to in my previous network and sit down and say, well, what do you think? Because a lot of the times they're in the same industry. Mm -hmm. And the second you reveal your weakness, they're like, oh, yeah, let's go and take, you mm -hmm. know, it's just toxic nonsense. So you have to kind of figure out how to surround yourself with people that are willing to give back to you and that are willing to to see you through some of those difficult um, times that you're going to run into. Like this last year was a great example of I became uh, the first time in my career a wartime CEO, right? Um, peacetime versus wartime, big thing. We can link an article in the description to discuss that. But basically, I was having to make very difficult decisions yeah. that I have never had to make before, right? Mm -hmm. As a peacetime CEO, you're chilling, everybody's happy. Or Like I would argue the first like five years of our existence, everything was like unicorns and rainbows yeah, yeah it was pretty much like wow we're great and oh my gosh we keep there's another client and we're, we're growing even more this is awesome it was, it was a celebration every it day, was yeah. a celebration every day and yeah. then last year with the economy going sideways and I, i've talked to a bunch of friends in this industry and they've all seen the same thing it was hard it was a mm -hmm. bloodbath and that put me in a bad mood and i had nobody to talk to so from there luckily i found some additional people in my network that were willing to talk to me 
and that were willing to be those rubber ducks because I'm a developer. So I'm going to rubber duck everything, right? To help me understand, am I making these right decisions? Mm -hmm. You know, and plus, you know, knowing that I have my senior leadership team like you and and Alan and Sarah relying on me to make those good calls is is even more stress, mm -hmm. right? Because if I make a mistake, it damages my credibility. But you know, we've built a system where it's okay to make mistakes to yeah. a point, right? And we trust each other and we try to give each other the grace necessary to do our jobs every day. But at the same time, I don't want to make a mistake. Yeah. Right. I've never been that person that just would be like, yeah, let's screw up. That sounds awesome. I don't think any person <laughs> would feel that way. But it's it's really difficult to grow. And the only thing I've found is just to, to look for organizations that aren't super opinionated because there are ones out there, stuff like EO, which again, there's nothing wrong with EO. But I am not a super like... I don't want opinionated methodology talk coming into me. Mm -hmm. I want real talk. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about what it's like mm -hmm. as the CEO of an X hundred million dollar company. What do you do every day? How do you focus on your people? How do you grow your people? How do you keep yourself healthy? Yada, mm -hmm. yada, yada. So those are the things that, that I've been able to focus on that is next for me is continuing to grow into the strategic brain and pushing the message of seven factor, which is those high quality, well-adjusted human beings into our client teams and focusing on focusing on that has really given me a sort of a renewed spirit for this year and building my network with people smarter than me that can help me, you know, not screw up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it really takes a village. I think we've all realized that. Uh, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all that we want to pick your brain about today. I know it's sure. hard to get a CEO's time. <laughs> so this was a very valuable session. But no, yeah. thanks, Alyssa. I love it. And, you know, if you like this episode, uh, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, we have some shorts planned for this type of stuff as well. But, um, uh, and also, if you just want to connect with me, uh, again, I, I'm happy to share anything that I've run into in my you know short time, seven years of doing this. I like to give back to the community. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and you know s share your story to me. I'd love to hear what you've run into. Yeah, knowledge is definitely power. We For don't sure. gatekeep knowledge around here. For sure. All right. Thank you. All right, we'll catch you all in the next one. Thank you, everyone. Yep, bye.